We're back, and we're centered on the widely discussed topic of children and vaccines, but this time as it relates to Louisiana. Do you know your child's immunization schedule? What about the immunization rates of your community and those around it? In today's episode, Dr. John Van Cherry of the LSU Health in Shreveport returns to the show. He's back to talk through these questions and highlight the impact of the Louisiana Shots for Tots Coalition. Thanks for joining us, Doc. This is a big one. Immunization records and knowing all of that good information, especially now. Let's talk about it. But you know what? Let's talk about Louisiana Shots for Tots first. Give us an overview. Well, Shots for Tots, um, it has been around for more than 30 years. It's, it's a private uh, public partnership, one of the first between public health agencies of the state and uh, community organizations with the goal to uh, improve our vaccination rates. And, and when it was founded, there was not a Vaccines for Children program uh, na- nationwide. And so that and at that time in Louisiana, most kids got their vaccines at the public health units. And that shift uh, over time has been to more vaccines are given for children in their private practice, a pediatrician or family medicine offices where they get primary care. But Shots for Tots goal was initially to deliver vaccines uh, widely, and it still has does that. But it also has a big education focus uh, for our communities to to really emphasize the safety and effectiveness of vaccines a- across our state. So it began, you said, 30 years ago, Dr. Van Cherry. Yeah. So have yeah. you seen the difference in the three decades once the program was began? And, you know, it's just people just know shots for tots. I, I mean, I love the name, of course, yeah. but, you know, it's just it's easy to remember parents, remember it. Mm-hmm. And it, it just seems like, as you said, it's a good educational tool overall. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, as I said, its mission has shifted a bit because so many more vaccines now are given in in Mm -hmm. medical offices than in the public health units. But at the time it was founded, um, our vaccination rates were very low and we were in the midst of a measles epidemic uh, in our nation in in the early 1990s. And, And so what Shots for Tots did was was bring vaccines out into the communities, bring the vaccines to where people were, rather than people having to come to the health units, take time off of work and and, and take their kids out of school to get vaccines, but really deliver the vaccines as close to, to people's homes and communities as they could. And that was tremendously successful. Um, a, as recently as six or eight years ago, Louisiana was ranked number two in the nation for completion of its primary immunization series for young children. And Unfortunately, we things have fallen off since then for for a lot of reasons. But um, uh, Louisiana can do it, and nice. Shots for Tots is an integral part of doing that. And it's nice to know we were at the top of a list for something good for a change. And even as you yep. said, it's fallen off somewhat. You, we can continue. We can do it. We can rebound. So that's nice. that's encouraging news. Please, that's great yeah. news. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about Louisiana's Infant Immunization Initiative. What is that? So the Infant Immunization Initiative is really uh, an education and advocacy campaign designed to, um, again, help young parents especially, or parents of young children especially, understand the importance and value of vaccinations for their children. I mean, we have conquered so many infectious diseases in the past century with vaccines, and especially the last half of the 20th century. And what we're seeing now is a waning of confidence in vaccines. A lot of that has been brought about just recently by the the politics of the pandemic not the science of the pandemic, but the politics of the pandemic. Correct. And, and so the infant initiative is, again, about restoring confidence, helping parents understand the value, and, and in fact, understand how vaccines work. And, and a lot of folks don't understand how vaccines work. Uh, they, they want to, but, but they may not. And, and we can talk about that as, as we go through. But, you know, there's some, some very concrete ways that we can um, help folks understand how vaccines work and make them more comfortable with that. And, and that's that. those are hard conversations sometimes because they can be complicated, 
but my job is also to help make them not complicated. So, so we can all understand what we're getting into. And that's one of the reasons that we're so pleased with this podcast, to be able to get the information out. This is no misinformation at all on this cast. And a lot of people, they'll Google something and they'll think, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, is that true? Is that true? But this is we're bringing you the truth. We have, you know, we have the medical professionals, the people who deal with this every day. And like you said, Dr. Van Sherry, you know, people don't understand. They want to try to understand. They want to do best for their children. But sometimes they don't know what questions they need to ask. And that, again, is where you come into play and where the initiative and the, the, tot, the Shots for Tots, all of that is good information to help the parents. Right. And and some parents uh, are, uh, frankly, might be embarrassed to ask sure. about yeah. how does the vaccine work? Because, you know, that 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 indicates that they're they're not educated on a particular topic. And, and again, so the, the better we can do it, communicating mm-hmm. our understanding of vaccines, helping parents understand that the 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 goal of vaccines is to educate the immune system. Exactly. Yes. And when you do that, you prevent illness and save lives. And and it's it, that the, the line is that direct mm-hmm. between vaccination and saving lives. And there are no stupid questions. You know, when it comes That's to the right, doctor exactly and right. your patient, there are no stupid questions. Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, what are the goals of the uh, Shots for Tots Coalition? So the the major goals right now are to. Uh, make vaccines available where they are needed. And and that would particularly apply to children who may not have insurance of any type, children who might not be on Medicaid for whatever reason, although Louisiana has the most broadly uh, um, generous, I would say, uh, Medicaid uh, standards for for, uh, being in the Medicaid program uh, of any state in in the country. There are still uh, about three to five percent of kids in in the state of Louisiana who have no type of no insurance at all or Medicaid, and so it, number one is making that va- making vaccines available to those children free of charge, and accessible accessibility is is the most important part there. And the second big goal of the Shots for Tots is that educational component, that advocacy component. Uh, in not just the political realms, mostly not in the political realms, but really in the community, among community organizations. And and importantly, Shots for Tots is a coalition. There are lots of sponsors and partners in that coalition who help spread the word about immunizations and make that a priority uh, in our communities. Because so many folks, organizations are involved, obviously, there has to be excellent resources that uh, we can go to. Can you talk about that a little bit, Dr. Van Cherry? The, the resources available, many of them are developed through the state public health agencies, but also independent of that. Through, and Shots for Tots is a, a major driver of those resources. We have great access to resources through the Centers for Disease Control and also um, uh, the World Health Organization even uh, to that we can use in our private practices in our communities, but we got to get those out further. Mm -hmm. And so Shots for Tots helps deliver those messages out to folks. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Since since this initiative has been launched, I would assume vaccination rates have gone up. Vaccination rates have have been very high. And what we uh, knew before the pandemic, uh, the State Academy of Pediatrics chapter actually did a survey across the state of vaccine attitudes. And it was very, very clear that Louisiana is a pro-vaccine state. And nobody was really surprised that somewhere upwards of 90% of respondents said schools should know what kids are vaccinated mm-hmm. and, and that vaccines were important for kids to go to school. And, and just things like that tell us that um, we're a pro-vaccine state. What's happened since then, uh, since the pandemic, and especially the politics of vaccines, as we've talked about, is that confidence has waned. There is a lot more uncertainty. And so when we repeated that study uh, and survey in the state population, we found that that the uncertain category had gone up tremendously. So what we're seeing as a reflection of that is that vaccine rates are lower now than they were before the pandemic, partly because of the pandemic disruption itself of the supply chains of access. We had doctor's offices closed. We had a lot of things because our resources were focused on the pandemic. But now it's time to get back to 
where we were before. Let's you know move those rates back up to where they need to be to provide good, secure protection for our kids and, and for our adults. That's exactly right. And, and you know, the thing is, too, I think a lot of people as you said, with the pandemic that threw everybody in kind of a tailspin. And now mm-hmm. we're getting back to our, you know, our pediatricians and our family doctors and asking questions. And and maybe some of our listeners today, they just want to know the simple answer to the simple question of why is it important to get children vaccinated? So uh, t- three major reasons. Number one, keep our children healthy in school, learning, you know, kids learn best when they're healthy. And so that's number one, keep our kids healthy. Number two, which is secondary to that, is, is save lives. I mean, vaccines save lives for children and for for adults. And and there's not a better example than vaccines like the pneumococcal vaccine or Haemophilus influenza vaccine that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, my father in private practice would take care of a child or two or three children a week with meningitis due to Mm. one of those germs. And now pediatricians who start out in practice now have never seen meningitis due to Haemophilus influenzae. And we're talking about diseases that have very high death rates and very high complication rates of brain injury and long-term health consequences. So the fact that we have conquered those big bad bacteria with vaccines is really phenomenal. Go even further back, measles. You know, measles vaccine has been used since the 1960s, a fantastic vaccine. And consequently, measles is not considered endemic in the United States any longer uh, as of more than 20 years ago. And that's because of the efficacy of the vaccines. But what's happening now with uptake of vaccines waning is we're threatened with those diseases coming back. And we're seeing more Haemophilus influenzae disease now that we hadn't seen for two or three decades and more pneumococcal disease. And oh, by the way, we're also seeing other you know, diseases that we don't have vaccines for come back in worse ways, like group A strep that causes strep throat. We're seeing more invasive group A strep disease now that we don't have a vaccine against. Hmm. And it's putting kids in the hospital or and, and a few kids have died of that in our state within the past several months. So, And then the third reason to vaccinate is because when we vaccinate children, we actually protect adults. Right. People mm-hmm. don't think about that very often. But there are two really good examples. The better our vaccine rates for influenza, for the flu, the fewer deaths, hospitalizations we have among elderly people due to influenza and, and pneumonia. And the second example is uh, particularly the pneumococcal vaccine, which is against a germ called Streptococcus pneumoniae. That's, that's a cause of ear infections and meningitis in, in children. And, and it was the most common cause of ear infections in children uh, for, for decades. And what we saw is when we started vaccinating kids against those diseases, those went away, very, very low levels of ear infections due to pneumococcus now. But also a secondary effect was that fewer elderly people were dying of pneumococcal disease. So by vaccinating our children, we, we indirectly protect our seniors. We don't have toddlers bringing germs to grandma and grandma and grandpa getting sick and or dying of those germs like we used to have. And that's a, that's a really important part of the, the reach of vaccines in our state and in our world. Incredible. And sometimes we don't connect those dots, Clay, do we? Right. You know, when we were talking about that. And and then you were saying too, Dr. Van Cherry, about some of these other, you know, when we're talking about measles and what have you, mm-hmm. that people have a tendency to think, oh, that was back in the day. Right. But it's not been eradicated. And as you said, if we don't stay on top of things mm-hmm. and if we're not vigilant, that can come back and we do not want to have to deal with that again. And, and it's so important when you mentioned vaccinating children because uh-huh. they can be little Petri dishes and so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and can bring anything yeah. home. So you want to be able to be certain anything about Anything and everything. Anything yeah. and everything. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, so many people are vaccinated at clinics or in their doctor's offices. So physicians have access to families. What can they do to increase the percentage of vaccinated populations within clinics? or in a physician's primary care office? So one of the things we've, we've been encouraging practices to do is, is really develop and, and be a climate of, 
of vaccine advocacy from the front desk to the, the patient room to the, the back office and, and, and the like, that the whole clinic be focused on the importance of vaccines. That may be signage you know, passively. That may be um, asking questions or, or talking more positively about vaccines, the importance of vaccines in an active way. All of those things build a climate of vaccine advocacy and a pro-vaccine climate that is really important for parents to understand the message. And I, I've encouraged physicians to do two things. One is look at their own vaccination rates within their practice. And if if your vaccination rate, say for measles, is 98% in your practice, post that on the on the wall in the in the in the waiting room. And, and that's going to do two things. For those who are in the 98% group, it's going to make them feel really good about mm-hmm. their decision. They're part of those who have have made a good decision for their children. And for the 2% who may not be vaccinated, it may make them think twice. It may make them think about, well, maybe my child's not eligible for a measles vaccine for whatever reason, because they're immune compromised. And that's important to know. It's important for that parent to know that the vast majority of patients in that clinic are uh, immunized against measles and therefore helping protect their own child who can't get vaccinated. Or if they've chosen not to vaccinate, if they're in that 2%, uh, then they're going to think twice, maybe they're hopefully, and they're going to ask, well, why am I in the minority? If the vast, vast majority of people have accepted measles, why have measles vaccine? Why have I not accepted measles vaccine for my child? And that just that information on the wall helps people think, think twice, ask more questions, dig a little deeper and hopefully make the best decision for their child. And you know, that starts that conversation between the parent and the pediatrician. Right. They saw that. That's an excellent point. I never thought about that. You know, they're sitting in the waiting room. They see that 98% is like, oh gosh, oh gosh, I really need to talk more about it. Because maybe they were on the fence and mm-hmm. they weren't sure what they are going to do. And that might just put them over. And then you've got 99% or 100%. How fabulous. Well, and you know, that it's a weird thing, but I've actually had this conversation with people and, and the... Doc, I'd I'd love your perspective on it. Some people, little children tend to scream like they're on fire (laughs) when they have to get any kind of vaccination or a shot. And that creates anxiety for some parents. And they delay it because they know they've got to go through about two minutes of horror. (laughs) But that little short term pain that the child will deal with does not compare to the long-term impact of not being up to date on vaccinations. Could you speak to that, Doc? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, as parents, the the hardest thing for us to do, I think, and I I have six children and- and, Oh gosh, you're a busy man. Wow. So the, 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 the thing that parents never want to do is make a decision that harms their child, right? Right. I mean, we always want to make the best decision for our child. And, and so you're right, you're right, Clay, that balancing out that, you know, 30, 40 seconds of the child upset, right. crying um, versus for measles, a lifetime of protection yeah. against a germ that can be really problematic uh, is, is what parents have to worry about. And parents now, young parents who've never seen measles, uh, even older parents who've mm-hmm. never seen measles, mm-hmm. you know, will say, well, why do I need to vaccinate against measles? Because it's not here. It's eradicated. I'll wait. If there's an outbreak, I'll do it. But the fact is that if if we don't maintain for measles at least 95% protection by vaccination, then the germ will find us. And right. it, it is the most infectious germ known in the world. And in fact, with measles, this has been a good example. If somebody with measles is in a room and then leaves, and two hours later, you walk in and you haven't been vaccinated, you can catch measles. Wow. That's how long it can linger. It's happened in airports. It's happened in other places. Oh, well documented, you know, kind of thing. And so and you don't know who's been in, you know, the area you've been you're, you're walking through in the mall or in a store or a public bathroom or an airport or whatever uh, that that may have had measles. And that's why a measles outbreak at, at Disney yeah. six or oh, eight years gosh. ago was yeah. such a big deal Damn. because. It's so infectious. You know, right? there, there was such a heightened amount of attention placed on 
restroom cleanliness. And depending mm. on where you go, that still exists, mm-hmm. but it's not as pervasive as it used to be. People aren't as germ conscious as they used to be. So it's important to protect yourself and your children. I, I do want to ask before we move away from that, are there any other concerns that you have heard from parents about why they may not want to vaccinate their children? This is the fear of harming their child. Okay. And what they don't think about really is that by not vaccinating, they're putting their child at greater You're risk. You're harming them more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what and about- so that, that is the biggest hesitation. Um, there are uh, some concerns about how vaccines are produced and and, um, and by and large, I mean, the, the safety data on vaccines is, is impeccable. Our vaccines are safer than they've ever been. Scientifically, I work, you know, every every week, every day to help improve the safety of vaccines in different ways. We've, we have um, the safest vaccine supply we've ever had. And, and so I think those reassurances that yes, there are people you know, like me, physician scientists working every week for safer, better vaccines for our children, but our vaccines are extremely safe. Um, a good example would be the pertussis vaccine that we used 20 years ago. It, it caused a lot of kids to have swelling in their arm after they got the shot and fever for several days. Mm -hmm. And so we went away from that type of vaccine that was basically uh, what we call a whole cell pertussis vaccine to a subunit vaccine where it's just a few specific components of the pertussis germ. And that vaccine has a better safety profile. That is fewer fewer reactions, not having arm swelling, uh, less fever, less side effects of the vaccine itself. However, we've sacrificed a little bit of, of effectiveness of the vaccine for a better safety profile. And that's just one example of how we're working to always balance those two factors. Um, I, I tell people, you know, if if you're, um, as an example, you know, if, if the doctor says, well, you might have cancer and therefore I'm going to start chemotherapy and it's with all these drugs that have all these side effects, you're going to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to take those medications because I might have cancer. You better prove that I have cancer before I subject my body to those, those big, big medicines. Well, the, the same is, is, is true or can be said about vaccines. And, and we've proven time and again, the safety profile of our vaccines and no long-term effects on, on fertility, no long-term effects on uh, brain development, all of those things. I mean, the, the statement that vaccines cause adults is, is really true. Part of getting out of childhood is being vaccinated and protected against those bad germs. The, por- the safety portfolio of our vaccines is, is, is impeccable. And yes, there are, for some vaccines, there are some short-term side effects, but no long-term side effects of vaccines related to fertility, related to brain development. All of those things are, are, are non-starters. Those are myths about vaccines. And, you know, with the COVID vaccine, we're using a little different type of vaccine, that mRNA vaccine mostly. And there are some uh, things that have happened. We know some of the side effects that potentially happen, like inflammation of the heart, especially in teenage boys, about one in 40,000. But with COVID infection itself, inflammation of the heart happens in about one to 2%, one to two out of 100. And so again, we're, we're learning, we're balancing out the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines as we learn more information about their use. And specifically with the, the COVID vaccines, there's been a lot of, a lot of discussion about, for young women, changes in their menstrual cycle uh, after getting the vaccine. And the, the, there were stories or anecdotes about that early, uh, early on, and, and the data that's available now says, yes, some women do have some changes in their menstrual cycle after getting COVID vaccines, but that's also not unique to COVID vaccines. And, um, and it, it is, you know, that happen, can happen for any number of reasons for women. We're trying to understand it. We need to understand it better to provide more reassurance. But um, that is in and of itself not a tremendous surprise. Other illnesses, other vaccines also can cause disruptions in the menstrual cycle or changes that are very temporary and last just a couple of months. So we're talking about, again, the the vaccines and the shots that your children need. There is a schedule uh, for shots that the child from the infant on, you know, through when they're just small children. What should they follow? What should you follow or the family know and the physician and 
if they get off schedule, do they have to start all over again? So the the Shots for Tots website uh, is shotsfortots.com. And that's a great resource for parents to see the, the recommended schedule for vaccination at each age group. There's a infant and child uh, link. There's a teenage link. And there's an, I think there's even have an adult link, even though adults are not tots. But um, <laughs> so the, but the, the, and the CDC has those schedules of recommendations as well. And, and so those are updated every year because there may be little changes. There may be new vaccine types available or, or alterations that are generally fairly minor. And, but it is updated every year. And so parents can look there to uh, to know what what vaccines their children should have. In general, there's no indication ever to restart a vaccine series. So if you've had two polio vaccines and you need three, and it's been six months or a year or however long it's been, several years, you don't restart with to go for three. You just get the third one and that's keep going. That's good to know. Yeah, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about the uh, what are the seven series of vaccines and why are they so important? The seven series vaccines includes pertussis, um, diphtheria, polio. Now you're going to trick me. Haemophilus, hepatitis B, and pneumococcus and tetanus. Did I say tetanus already? Uh, no. Anyhow. Nice. Wow. All right. Did I get it right? You did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a tough, well, well, tough list. Wait a minute. Did, Maybe I'm unqualified did, to say if you got sure, it right. Sure. But there were seven of them named. <laughs> so <laughs> when you're talking about pertussis, is that whooping cough? Is that that's pertussis? whooping cough? Okay, yeah. I, I kind of get those mixed up. All yeah. those all those words sometimes they kind of blend together in my brain, and I wanted to right. make sure our listeners knew what that was. Okay. Yeah, pertussis is whooping cough, okay. and that's one where. Um, you know, now all pregnant women are recommended to get a booster that includes pertussis during pregnancy because uh, babies in the first two months of life are not are not ready to get a pertussis vaccine and they're not old enough and their immune system doesn't respond well to the vaccine at that age. But if we vaccinate mom during pregnancy against pertussis, that protects the baby for the first two to three months of life when they're most vulnerable to pertussis. And pertussis can lead to serious uh, illness and death in infants that young. And you were talking, too, about uh, the schedule. And you said, you know, adults aren't taught, obviously, but adults still need to be updated Mm -hmm. on their shots, on their schedule every 10 years for some. So just because you think you've, quote unquote, outgrown childhood Mm -hmm. diseases or the need for vaccinations, that's that's not true. For adults, we... We vaccinate against different diseases. Some are some are common, but mm-hmm. but also different diseases. So we use the Zoster uh, vaccine in adults over age fifty, a very effective vaccine. Even though they may have had uh, the chickenpox vaccine as a child, the right. Zoster vaccine is is important for adults to uh, prevent long term complications. Yeah. Is that for shingles? Is that shingles? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Two terms. Yeah. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Yeah. We're learning here. That's the whole yeah. point of this podcast. So we asked about seven. Uh-oh. What about the 10 series? The 10 series extends up to the um, preschool age group. That gets you to four to five years old. Okay. And that includes your measles, mumps, and rubella. So how is this different? Uh, uh, and are, is it measured different than, say, the seven? So the the I guess the way we look at those the data for each of those series is in terms of completion, we know that the seven series the the infant toddler series were not as successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, our rates of 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 completion of that series are somewhere in the high eighties to low nineties uh, in in good areas, uh, and in some areas they may be as low as the sixties or seventy percent range, depending again on access. Uh, attitudes, a lot of different factors weigh into that. But um, once kids start in school, our school-based requirements for vaccines, we get a lot of catch up on those seven series and uh, do very well with the 10 10 series, adding the three live virus vaccines, the the measles, mumps, and rubella. So the, the school requirements are really a foundation of public health. Uh, They protect our children in school they're also important for kids who may be homeschooled as well, because the risk is not specific to being in school. Mm-hmm. The risk is related to their age and their susceptibility and exposure to these 
particular germs. Excellent and so, point. Yeah, the homeschoolers. Yeah. 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 We don't talk about them Mm-mm. enough. We always talk about kids on a school campus, but yes. there are a number of children who are being taught at home. Yeah. Yeah, about about five, six percent uh, is the last number I knew statewide. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, for I know lots of parents who homeschool and, and they love it and it works for their families. And for some, that is uh, an excellent way to educate your children. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not at the same risk as children uh, and teenagers also included uh, for diseases like meningococcal disease and, and measles, et cetera. That's an important point to make, too, because mm-hmm. our listeners need to know that. Right. But just because they're, they are they may think that they're just in a smaller a, a community. They're not in, you know, the the, commu- the community right. out and about, that this is critical for the smaller family group as well. You know, Dr. Van Cherry, if someone wanted to join or help support uh, uh, Shots for Tots, mm-hmm. what would you suggest they do? Is there something that our listeners can do to be a part of this initiative? For, for businesses and community organizations, they can join the Shots for Tots Coalition. And again, their website is probably the best link to get that. It's shotsfortots.com. And, or you can Google Louisiana Shots for Tots and it'll pull you right to the website. For um, individuals who want to support the efforts of the Shots for Tots Coalition, they can make direct donations and they can volunteer in some areas uh, when, when need arises for helping with you know, bringing the mobile shot van out oh, to places okay. and uh, helping organize folks, keep them in line and you know, as needed, all those kind of things. So there are volunteer opportunities as well. I didn't realize that. That's excellent. Yeah. 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 Is there anything, Dr. Van Cherry, that this has been an excellent conversation, right. number one. Absolutely. Number two, is there anything that we did not cover that you would like for folks, you know, listening today to know about or just to be reminded of when it comes for Shots for Tots? Well, I think there are there are thousands of things we haven't covered, but we've covered all the things. Okay. And uh, and so the next twenty podcasts we can do together, and we all can right. hit another okay. few hundred. All so right. I think my message would be would be simple, and, and that is, ask questions. Mm-hmm. If you have concerns, ask questions. And your your pediatricians, the nurses in their clinic, the family medicine doctors, OB, any any physician should be ready to answer those questions Mm -hmm. or get those answers for you. Mm -hmm. And so asking questions helps me when patients ask me questions. It helps me understand where they are in their thought process and where they are in their understanding about vaccines and the like. And vaccines, uh, you know, I, I use the examples that vaccines are like a fire drill for your immune system. They tell your immune system, they educate your immune system on what to do if the real germ shows up. And, and that's what we want. That's that's the simple way vaccines work. They mm-hmm. all work with that same goal. Educate the immune system what to do if the real germ comes by. That is a, an amazing and a fabulous way to end this podcast with that thought. So, Dr. Van Cherry, thank you for your time today. Thank you for giving us your expertise and helping people feel more comfortable and to know Ask, talk to your doctor. No stupid question. No dumb question. Don't be reluctant. Just get it out there and just talk because it's about your health, the health of your children, about your children's grandparents. Everything is rolled into one. So again, thank you to everyone who joined us today uh, by way of listening to our podcast. We hope for you to join us again for another Vax Matters. <music>